afternoon, everyone. This is Greg Burris. I'm Director of Investment Portfolio uh, Oversight and Reporting. Uh, and on behalf of the entire executive team at Foundation for the Carolinas, uh, welcome you to this uh, third quarter webinar. Uh, before I hand it off to Tim and Travis, I uh, just want to mention that if at any time during the webinar you have any questions or would like further clarification on a topic, uh, please post your questions in the chat window. Uh, the Mercer team will address these uh, after the presentation uh, during the Q&A portion of the webinar. So with that, um, Travis, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Greg. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you all today. Thanks a lot for spending a few minutes with us. Uh, I'm going to do my uh, our regular check-in, so we'll go through the markets. We'll talk about your options and how they've performed over the course of the third quarter. I'll give you a little bit of sense of how things have changed since the end of the third quarter. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about a new donor option today that's been made available for, by the Foundation for the Carolinas, uh, something that um, we're happy to provide an update on and uh, answer questions for. So let's jump right in. And from a big picture perspective, excuse me, it was a bit of a rocky quarter, really culminating in a pretty challenging September. Um, equity market returns around the world were negative in the month of September. Uh, but as you can see, the MSCI ACWI, which is the global stock market, finished the quarter down 1.1%, uh, which the blue bars here, you can see from a gray bar perspective that through the first nine months of the calendar year, uh, still pretty good absolute returns up about 11%. <laughs> Excuse me, that breaks down. Uh, U.S. markets led the way. Uh, pretty tough September for the S&P 500, but all in all, still finished the quarter positive, up about a half a percent, and uh, still nearly 16% absolute return for the first nine months of the year. Developed markets is measured by EFA, about a half, down about a half a percent, but still positive for the year. The real story for the quarter was emerging markets, and as we saw. Uh, China start to take their next phase of regulatory uh, improvements and perhaps in some ways modernization. Uh, we did see the stock market get uh, uh, beat up a little bit in the in the quarter after what had been uh, for emerging markets in the first six months of the year, a pretty good period. So the through the first nine months of the year, we did it finish down about 1.2% uh, in the emerging markets, which helped uh, drive that overall lower global equity returns. And then bond returns as measured by the, the Barclays aggregate, about flat for the quarter. So when we break that down, one of the notions that we saw and that we continue to see is this growing concern around inflation. And that has manifested in or manifested in pretty solid returns for the quarter in more inflation sensitive type securities. So commodity futures, so think oil, cotton, uh, really the raw materials that go into economic growth. Those were up quite a bit as investors started to discount in uh, the near-term inflation that we most certainly have experienced, as well as the potential for longer-term inflation. And then as well, uh, uh, or I guess coincident to that, uh, was also good performance for the quarter in U.S. tips. And so if you're, uh, for those that maybe need a, a brush up or a reminder, uh, tips are treasury inflation protected securities. And what they really are is their coupons are indexed to changes in the rate of inflation, uh, which is a real positive for a bondholder. Uh, inflation is a, is a bad thing if you're a long-term holder of bonds. And so we did see those two parts of the market bounce pretty strongly in the, in the third quarter as fears of inflation and actual inflation really manifested as we've seeing this disconnect uh, between strong demand and available supply across the spectrum in terms of both goods and services. I mentioned U.S. large cap stocks in that environment were still positive, up about a half a percent, uh, and emerging markets were negative over that period. But you can see, by and large, uh, about a split, you know, about a split lineup, if you will, in terms of over and out performance for the quarter. Uh, translated on a year-to-date basis, that 6.6% that return did bump the commodity return uh, up uh, nearly 30% for the year-to-date period. So it's been a while since we've seen commodities perform like that. And that is pretty reflective of some a fair degree of inflation concern in the short term. Uh, to a slightly lesser extent, but still pretty, uh, pretty impressive absolute return number, our natural resource stocks, 
Uh, these are global natural resource stocks. Uh, so I think oil companies, materials companies around the world uh, performed really pretty well uh, ahead of that U.S. large cap position. But we have seen uh, some translation in this period of uh, uh, some more concern about inflation, but still overall for the course of the year, still pretty positive view as being priced into, into equity markets for overall growth. Uh, both in the U.S. as well as outside the U.S. And bonds, uh, as Emma noted, still negative on a year-to-date basis. Most of that was first quarter activity as we saw yields peak. Uh, yields have bounced around quite a bit uh, since that time, uh, and still, but still down 1.5% for the year. We have seen some, uh, we saw really at the end of the first quarter, rotational leadership. So if you recall, uh, around uh, late October into November, when the vaccines first hit the uh, availability, uh, the global markets, and especially in the U.S. markets, are very excited about economic growth. And we saw small cap stocks really lead the way for the better part of the next six months. Uh, as the economic recovery has progressed and investors have started to digest, where do we go from here? We have seen leadership rotate back, uh, back towards larger cap stocks for the last couple of quarters. Uh, and more away from some of the value stock performance that we saw late last year uh, and strength early this year to more recent uh, growth stock performance uh, uh, in the marketplace. And that suggests to us that investors pulling in their horns a little bit, a little less convinced as to the directionality of economic growth. And so we have seen growth markets uh, perform a little bit better uh, than value markets on a quarterly basis. You can see that in the green bars, albeit they're not very big, uh, but you can see in, in large cap especially, uh, growth did better, uh, mid cap better, uh, value actually did a little bit better in the smaller cap part of the marketplace uh, over the course of the quarter. And then we have seen in your portfolios, we do own some quality, uh, higher quality stocks as a strategy and minimum lower volatility stocks, uh, basically both flat to slightly up for the quarterly period and, and good strong absolute performance for the full year. Uh, so good, good participation in your portfolios as we'll see coming up. So as we think about what's coming up, uh, what, what are we doing forward? One of the other notions that we have, it's, it almost seems like we've talked so much less about it, it's becoming a part of our lexicon every day, is the notion of COVID cases. And, and here we've tracked, uh, captured the seven day moving average of new COVID cases. So the Delta wave, which also contributed to concerns uh, around economic growth in the in the third quarter, it seems to be peaking and rolling over in the near term. Uh, our expectation might be, you know, we we might see more of this. And as the arc of this curve turns back north, uh, if it does, we might expect that to add some volatility to to equities. But certainly in the near term, uh, slower growth of cases, fewer cases, through fewer positive momentum in cases, uh, suggest that we have the opportunity to maintain economic growth. Uh, maybe work through some of these supply issues that we've been uh, dealing with. I mentioned inflation, and you can see here on the right-hand side of this chart that, uh, oops, sorry, uh, from an inflation perspective, we certainly have gotten a peak. Circle over here, hopefully you can see that. Uh, we have seen a, a really shoot up inflation, but you can see right here at the tips of these charts, we actually have seen them start to moderate some. Uh, our view has been that much of the factors that have driven these and these short-term inflationary impacts are transitory. Uh, and, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, the, uh, because the, of the global shortage of chips uh, for the auto industry, we did see the availability of new cars fall quite significantly as automakers were unable to deliver complete new cars to dealers. As a result, those folks that wanted to buy a car had to consider buying a used car uh, and the supply of used cars went down uh, because folks that wanted to buy a new car had to keep their old car. And so we did see uh, used car pricing go up quite significantly. That's a pretty big contributor here. Uh, and then certainly from a, a total CPI perspective, which includes food and energy, we did see food and energy prices uh, pop up as, we, you know, we've, as we've seen the price of oil accelerate. But some of those supply constraints are starting to work out ever so slowly. We do think still that those supply demand notions will uh, transition out. And as a result, uh, we, 
uh, do still have a primarily transitory view on inflation with a couple of things that we're, that we're watching, uh, most notably about wage growth and, uh, uh, and the, per, per, uh, uh, the ongoing notion of wage growth. The other component here, uh, the other component here that gives us some comfort that, uh, as to what the market's thinking is this notion of uh, longer term inflation. So short term inflation is a big deal, uh, but if we're right in our transitory notion then over some shorter term horizon, maybe it's up to 24 months, we'll start to see the inflation figures flatten out. Uh, and that seems to be what the market is projecting. So here, uh, it's a it's a rather technical curve, but this what this chart says is uh, it reflects the views of what market participants are pricing for expected inflation five years out. Uh, and what you can see is that this current level of inflation of about to shy of two and a quarter percent is what the market suggests pricing levels might be. Uh, on a, uh, uh, excuse me, what inflation might be five years forward. And that's pretty consistent. If you just follow this chart along back in time, that's pretty consistent with where we have been for the better part of the last 10 years. Clearly in 2020, we had a step down, uh, but we're not particularly out of range over the last decade. Uh, and as a result, that suggests to us that the market believes that the inflation components might be uh, uh, might be transitory. And I've got, I know there's a couple of questions coming in and I will, uh, I'm going to jump on those at the end. Uh, so we don't think markets have priced significantly or substantially higher long-term inflation expectations in to, uh, uh, into prices, but it is something that we're not being complacent on. Uh, we are watching closely, but from a portfolio construction perspective, where we have real assets or those investments that would be more consistent with inflation protection, we are uh, continuing to maintain those at our target levels uh, so that we can make sure that our portfolios are participating uh, and protecting against any short-term expectations. So that's a quick take on where we have uh, been from a big picture perspective. Let's, let's jump into the building blocks uh, and how the pieces of your portfolios have performed. Uh, and, then, um, uh, and then I'll circle back with questions uh, at the end. So, uh, as you recall, uh, as you know, we we build your portfolios based on uh, a set of consistent building blocks, uh, actively managed portfolios with some passive exposures uh, to deliver uh, hopefully excess returns. Not a great uh, absolute return, excuse me, not a great active quarter. We did have some some marginal underperformance. Uh, our U.S. equity strategy actually outperformed by quite uh, quite a bit uh, for the quarter, and that allowed us to move year to date uh, ahead of our benchmark, so up about a half a percent. Uh, for that portfolio, uh, but you can see that non-U.S. equity, uh, our developed market equity, and our emerging markets equity both underperformed a little bit uh, for the quarterly period. Both have performed very strongly over the course of the full calendar year, uh, and so we did give a little bit of that back uh, in the third quarter. And then Mercer Global Opportunities, as, as you recall, is a component of the uh, diversified long-term growth strategy. It is a more eclectic, uh, higher active strategy and so it will its returns will be more lumpy if you will relative to the benchmark and we certainly experienced a bit more of that in the court it's had a bit of a tough year uh, your experience uh, in the diversified long-term growth since we since we added it uh, has actually been quite positive overall but a more sh uh, in the shorter term it's been a little bit of rough, a rougher go you can see that even with those strong sub some of those strong subcomponent portions of return from a real asset perspective for the quarter still flattish, uh, but uh, overall really pretty good long-term returns from the real assets component. Uh, and as I mentioned, yield to date results are still really pretty good. If we look at the diversifying strategies and the, and the lower risk portions of our portfolio in terms of hedge funds fix, uh, and the two fixed income uh, components, uh, the hedge fund had a small amount of underperformance versus the composite index for the quarter. Uh, but continues to outperform on a year-to-date basis versus our fund of funds uh, benchmark. Uh, and importantly, because in diversified long-term growth, we own this hedge fund allocation in lieu of more bonds, uh, its outperformance of the bond market over the course of the year has been quite, uh, quite demonstrable. It's really what we seek for it to do. Uh, pretty good active management uh, for the fixed income fund for the year-to-date in line for the quarter. Uh, and, uh, 
uh, we're still really pretty happy with the way that's going. And similarly for our low duration strategy, oops, sorry, low duration strategies in line for the quarter uh, and modestly ahead for the year. Uh, we do have low duration uh, as part of each uh, of most of the portfolio construction uh, amongst the standard pools, and we are mod and we are modestly overweight that lower duration positioning. One thing I didn't talk to about today is the general direction of interest rates. We we are of the opinion that the Fed will taper their bond market purchases, which we believe will, will potentially steepen the yield curve and put some, uh, will raise interest rates to some degree in the short term. Uh, and then we'll, I think we'll see the Fed figure out the impact of that as they consider where they go with actual raising of interest rates or changes to the interest rate regime in the short term. As a result of that, we do want to be lower duration than our benchmark uh, because as interest rates go up, that generates negative returns. And the longer uh, maturity your portfolio is, the more negative return, all things being equal. And so we are overweight these shorter maturity strategies uh, today. So all of that resulted in this uh, for uh, the period. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, the, the, the year started with quite a bit of optimism, but we did see with those negative numbers, some pullbacks, a uh, little bit of underperformance in our standard pools, our active standard pools, pretty close, but just a little bit of underperformance for each of the three active uh, primary active pools or multi-manager pools versus their benchmarks for the quarter, uh, but still on a year-to-date basis, still really pretty solid results against our benchmarks year-to-date, uh, which might be my next bullet. Yeah. Uh, and then if we compare our two longest-term active strategies, the active long-term growth and diversified long-term growth, Relative to the, the passive option, these three options, as you may as you may be aware, all have very similar long-term risk reward objectives. And you can see both of your uh, two active strategies have been pretty competitive against the passive strategy as well. So uh, before I jump into questions with Greg, I think uh, what I'd like to do is take you through uh, the new donor pool. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Greg to jump in anywhere where I might um, uh, where I might miss something important. But uh, in the third quarter, uh, after several months of conversation and design, uh, the foundation did uh, uh, launch uh, an ESG focused donor pool, and uh, that donor pool has some key characteristics. Uh, it is a long term focus, so its ass overall asset allocation is in line with the three pools I just closed the previous page with. So the long, the diversified long-term growth, the active long-term growth, and the passive long-term growth all have broad uh, equity to fixed income allocations of approximately 75% equity, 25% fixed, fixed income. So the ESG donor pool sits in the same place, if you will, from a risk reward perspective uh, as those other three donor pools. Uh, so we wanted to make we wanted to create a long term option. The, the investment committee wanted to create a long term option that uh, aligned with those other objectives for for long term donors. This, it, as it stands today, it's liquid strategies only. So these are all public market securities. So public market stocks and bonds are included in the strategy, uh, with a substantial focus on mutual funds, which really just eased our implementation approach uh, as we launched this out of the gate. Uh, pool is, you know, you're going to have the same rules and operating procedures as all the other pools. It's really just steps into the lineup as a new option uh, for donors to use. And as I mentioned, it is live and funded uh, today. What does it look like? Uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, we are, uh, as we are with the other portfolios, we are globally diversified. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the blue uh, parts of our chart here are U.S. stocks. The brown is global equity, the green is international equity, and the light blue uh, is fixed income. And you can see similar to our other, other strategies, we do use multiple managers across most of the asset classes, uh, uh, with the, perhaps the exception of U.S. large cap, uh, which similar in, as in the U.S. equity LLC, uh, the U.S. large cap allocation is passive. Uh, and so we have uh, we've taken the same investment approach in the ESG pool. We've gone passive, but with a a more socially aligned index fund. Uh, this the approach to creating the ESG awareness is driven by 
Mercer's research views uh, on each of these managers from an ESG perspective. So when we evaluate an active manager, we, in addition to assigning a letter grade that expresses our view on the likelihood of that manager outperforming going forward, we also express an ESG rating, which uh, is our evaluation of the integration of ESG factors into uh, their investments, their investment approach. And so ESG, I'm sorry, I'm throwing around that term ESG, that's environmental, social, and governance uh, focus. So it's, it's a, it, when, an invest, when a manager invests with ESG in mind, they are paying much more attention and they integrating more uh, additional risk factors and growth factors into their decision-making that are more, more specifically tied to things like the environment. Uh, so whether that's clean energy or reducing pollution or social issues, uh, which could mean uh, equal opportunity or living wages uh, uh, and governance issues. So it's the diversity of boards or the diversity of decision makers uh, or just good governance overall, which is a pretty standard tool in active management. We evaluate how those managers integrate those solutions into their investment strategy, and then we assign them an ESG grade. So if you can read this tiny type on this chart, uh, you can see the, on average uh, ESG rating between a one and a two, uh, and ESG one being the highest integration of uh, social of, of these ESG factors into the investment strategy. We also sought to build in to this uh, matrix of managers uh, more attention to, uh, or we wanted to be attentive to. Uh, more diverse teams and diverse ownership. So uh, nearly half the assets in the portfolio are managed by either firms or teams that are uh, uh, predominantly influenced or influenced strongly by either minority investors or uh, uh, women-led teams. So a good mix of managers, like I said, this investment is uh, now uh, made. Uh, it's up and running, it's live. Uh, we will start, um, uh, it was funded mid-October, so or uh, started funded mid-October, so we will uh, have performance for it uh, in the coming months to see how it's all coming together. But these are all highly rated strategies from our investment team. They go through the same investment manager process as the other managers that we use in your program, uh, and we're excited to uh, to get this launched. So with that, I'll pause uh, and uh, take some questions uh, and anything else, Greg, you might want to throw in here. No, that's good. Appreciate it, Travis. Uh, and yeah, I was going to mention just what you said at the very end there that you know there is no compromise on the managers they use to build out this ESG portfolio relative to uh, the managers used in the investment pools that you've been hearing about uh, to date. So um, just wanted to make sure that was understood. And and we're very excited about this uh, opportunity at Foundation for the Carolinas. And certainly, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you want to get the fact sheet on this fund, uh, you can contact us um, on our website and happy to get that to you. So I will go ahead and start with the Q&A if Mercer team is ready. Um, as you might expect, we did have a couple on inflation. So I'll, I'll mention both of those because they're similar. Um, first of all, what would cause you to change uh, the portfolio in terms of the, the, the inflation? And if, if you were going to make a change, change, what would you do? And then the other question is, how much inflation do you think the Fed will tolerate before taking action? Uh, well, let me tackle the second one first. Uh, <laughs> I think, so I guess my short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll start there. Uh, I do think the signaling from the Fed, though, is that they are, if the factors that appear to be driving inflation today uh, remain in place, then there is a, uh, in our view, a very cogent line of thinking that Fed activity can't address it. So if inflation, short-term inflation today is being driven by a supply-demand imbalance, and that there is significant, much more demand than there is supply available for certain goods and services, then that may not be, that Fed activity can't necessarily fix supply chains. And so while the Fed could raise rates and start and, and squelch off demand, uh, 
that seems less likely in our minds that if it remains a supply issue uh, because of disruption rather than we're just out of whack uh, from a supply demand, then we would we'd put a lower probability on action there. And, and therefore, we'd suggest they'd be willing to tolerate some additional inflation before taking some action. Uh, if they start, if we start to see inflation, in fact, those what we believe to be transitory inflation factors start to, to moderate and we see more sustained increases, say, in wages, uh, then you might find the Fed, you might find the Fed a bit more uh, proactive in terms of raising rates only because Fed or only because um, wage inflation historically has been more uh, uh, historically has been more durable, if you will, uh, you know, per percentage growth on um, percentage growth of wages. It's hard to it's hard to tell back wages. It's easy to cut the price of gas. It's easy to cut the price of a good or a service It is much more difficult to cut wages uh, and reduce wages going forward. Uh, in terms of what we would do. Uh, uh, and uh, for the let me come off this page. Uh, for the longer term portfolios, we'd likely reevaluate our overall allocation to real assets. It's generally speaking about 10% of the portfolio. Uh, we're the, you know, again, depending on the nature of where that inflation was going. If, if it's if it's short term, if we think it's still shorter term inflation, that feels very tactical. And, and as we've told you before, that's not a place where we feel like we add a lot of value, is to try to you know, take the natural resources position up by double because we think, you know, oil is going to be high. That's just not something we think we're not good at and we think most people aren't. And so that that's not a reaction that we're likely to, to bring. If we felt like uh, there were more durable longer term inflation, we felt like it wasn't really going to be transitory. And in fact, we might be in a longer term inflationary cycle. And we then we might look at uh, raising our allocation to some of those more sensitive areas like natural resources, uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, and, um, and real estate, which have been classically, they've had more sensitivity to inflation and changes in inflation over time and try and build on a bit more protection. I guess the last component there is, is if, if the inflation is higher but is within expectations, then stocks actually can be a pretty good place for that because wage increases end up being passed along in the form of price increases which helps to protect earnings, which will ultimately help to protect stock values. Kim, I don't know if you'd add anything there. Yeah, that was the point I was going to make is, is historically, um, you know, companies and stocks and equity markets have been able to pass that inflation along to consumers and provide reasonable protection. It's not going to be a direct one-to-one -one correlation with inflation, but um, maintaining our equity exposure and, and targets will help. And then also, I think to some extent, we rely there on active managers to dynamically rebalance within sectors and companies to position their portfolio. So that's something we'll also monitor. And then uh, just one point, stepping back to the first question, um, you know, back in, I guess, 2012, the Fed formally set the 2% uh, the inflation target. And then last year, they at, um, announced an average inflation framework. So previously, I mean, we thought of inflation as the Fed was going to keep kind of a 2% lid on that. And I think now the guidance is they may let it run a little bit higher because historically over the last, you know, eight plus years, that has been running below that average 2% target. And so we still do have a, a little bit of room to catch up to that 2% um, year to year average. All right. Very good. Uh, next question is any geopolitical headlines uh, that you would expect to disrupt things in 2022? Uh, well, timing wise, again, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of potential, uh, had, you know, certainly uh, tensions with China have not abated. They tend to rotate into and out of the, the headlines, but uh, the, it's still an issue. We're still uh, figuring out how to work together with one another uh, at globally, so I do think that you know there's the potential uh, for disruption from from those notions. Uh, there's the potential for you know internal 
disruptions from the standpoint of where we, we just we're just starting into the next round of of uh, election cycle. You know, there was a there was an election in Virginia for governor last night. Uh, there's an awful lot of people that believe they know an awful lot of things about what that what that election outcome means and what it will mean uh, nationally. Uh, and because there are an awful lot of opinions that creates a lot of news cycle, a lot of noise that could theoretically uh, impact markets at various points in time. Uh, if I haven't said this here before, I'll say it, I'll say it again. Uh, elections happen all the time. Regimes change all the time. Uh, I'm strongly of the view that you know, once there's a decision made by a regime, whether it's higher taxes or higher spending or what have you, it's a step change function and the market goes on from there. Uh, and so that that can cause some volatility in the short term, could change the trajectory of things like interest rates and earnings. Uh, but it, it's those end up being known quantities at some point. The market adapts and moves on, in, in my view. So, you know, there's always there's the you know there's the known unknowns. There's the and then there's of course the unknown unknowns. You never know when something might boil over in the Middle East again, uh, or some change in uh, and amongst the other big power players in Asia, so there's always something on the horizon. Uh, I think that's a big reason why we continue to 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 preach the gospel of diversified portfolios and and driving our returns from multiple different places. All right. Well, I do not have any other questions um, showing up. Uh, again, Tim and Travis, thanks so much for participating in this. Uh, and hey, Greg, I I did see oh. another one uh, pop up. I don't know if okay. we have a minute or two to capture that on the on the chat. Ah, that must have just come in. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and read that. Uh, the old adage, don't fight the Fed, uh, may now require different logic with the Fed tapering and higher rates. Is there an asset allocation opportunity toward value type investments and tips, or is large cap growth still a safe haven? Thanks, Tim. Uh, that is a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, <laughs> I just sat in on a I sat in on a, a conversation yesterday, and I I sort of asked the very same question, but in the context of small cap. Uh, sorry, the sun came out here and it's blinding me. Uh, I, I don't know that it's an I don't know that it's an easy question to answer. The classically, we might argue that if rates start to go up, uh, that that has historically been a pretty good time for value investments. Uh, the question I had for the manager I spoke with yesterday, uh, and I think is sort of it ends up with an it depends number, is whether that really translates into accelerated earnings growth for more value oriented companies. Uh, certainly, higher interest rates will be bad for valuations for for large cap growth stocks and growth stops in general. Uh, not to get too wonky, but uh, if rates go up, that's that means that that makes their valuation seem that much more expensive, and they get repriced to reflect the interest rate environment. the The flip side to that is if if value if stocks that sit in the value camp don't show earnings acceleration, this market has been less willing uh, to just buy on valuation. And so I think there is still a bit of it depends. Generally speaking, we do find value moderately more attractive today because it is. We, we do believe valuations over time work, uh, and certainly larger cap growth stocks and growth stocks in general are a bit more expensive. Uh, but we think the market activity more recently has also been uh, to um, uh, to allude to Tim's home state of Missouri. There's a fair amount of show me when it comes to earnings growth, and the the safety trade has been to roll back into uh, larger cap growth names, those are those are companies that are generating quite substantial profit growth. So they're not there's not a it's not a bad reason to own the names. Uh, but when things get rocky, investors have shown a quite a bit of appetite to ro rotate back in. So I think there is some wait and see. Uh, this is something we're we're talking about internally. Uh, we're reasonably balanced uh, with still a uh, we're reasonably balanced in the US with a slight bias to value overall. Uh, so we think that that's a positive for the portfolio. But uh, it has been certainly less evident over the last six months of the market uh, that, uh, or more evident, I guess, over the last six months of the market that as things have gotten a little bit rocky and have, as expectations around economic growth have been questioned, 
that investors have been much more comfortable rotating back into those larger cap growth names. And, and I think that there's a little bit of relation between you know tapering higher rates of value as uh, you know as we see economies reopen globally and, and supply chain disruptions mitigate. Um, you know the higher economic growth um, puts greater likelihood of tapering and higher interest rates on the table, but also as those economies reopen and, and things resume back to normal, value should do well. Those companies that have been kind of penalized and on the sidelines should recover instead of just a, a handful of select growth names leading markets. All right, good, I'm glad we uh, caught that question. Appreciate that. Um, so as always, Tim and Travis, we appreciate uh, your support here and sharing your thoughts and insights you know, with our donors. Uh, and thanks to all the participants. Uh, we hope you did find it uh, informative and helpful. And uh, if you wanted to see a recording or direct a colleague to, to hear it, uh, it is gonna be posted on our webinar uh, as soon as possible. So thank you once again, and hope the rest of your week goes very well. Thanks everyone, thanks for the questions. Thank you.